Father, we just come to you this morning in Jesus' precious and wonderful name to say thank you that we are free to worship you, that we are free to praise you, we are free to express ourselves any way we want to without any fear of restriction. And God, you are the being, you are the Father who is in our midst, whom we want to love and adore. And so we've been able to do that, and we've been able to give to you, which is the most enormous privilege. And Father, I pray that as I minister the word this morning and as Christy comes to follow me, I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to be upon us both. I pray, God, that your word would go out as a a two-edged sword to cut and to heal, I pray, Father, that the word of God would not be hindered or restricted in any way whatsoever in Jesus' name, that every high thing would be brought down. It would not exalt itself against the knowledge of God or above the knowledge of God. I take authority over everything that would come against this word. Um, I, the word that is preached this morning, to affect it, to blind any person's eyes or to steal the word. No weapon of yours will prosper, devil. And as I'm submitted unto God and resist you, you will flee in Jesus' name. And so, God, I ask now that you would cause this word to be anointed and that you would cause it to be relevant and personal to everyone who speaks. I'm trusting you, God, that people are not going to go away from here feeling downhearted, but go away feeling encouraged within their hearts with a new revelation of your love. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. So, last couple of weeks, I've preached to you about, here I am, Lord, change me. And then last week, we looked at changed by love. And today, I want to minister to you on the subject of treat me like a son, Lord. And so that's, you know, and what I'm going to be touching on in my part of the, of the morning, I'm going to be touching on the subject of discipline. And, you know, nobody likes to hear about being disciplined. I think it kind of gives us that image of going into the headmaster's office when we were at school. You know, when your teacher said, okay, I think you need to go to the office. You know what that meant. Um, especially in the days days gone by when that meant that he would bring out a cane, you know, and the boys would come out holding their backsides and, you know, jumping around and actually boasting about how sore it had been, you know, and um, they got six of the best. Kids nowadays don't know what the rest, what their parents went through. No idea. How, who says let's bring it back? <laughs> Mrs. Burt is just having something to say before I carry on. What did you say, Esther? Um, Esther says she hopes all of you will come and swing it in her office. But anyway, when we talk about discipline, it really does give us a negative connotation, doesn't it? Um, Or even if you think of your parents disciplining you, it brings up a sense of something, there's something negative about discipline. But I want to show you in the word that that is not so that we have to be disciplined. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. He says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. So there's right away, it says, don't resent, don't resent a rebuke, but also don't despise being disciplined by the Lord. Because if God loves you, listen to me, if God loves you, he is going to discipline you. Simple. If your parents love you, they will discipline you. Nobody likes a child that is undisciplined, whose parents never correct it. And I'm hearing some very, you know, fervent yeses and amens. What's it like when you go to the the supermarket and hear somebody with a toddler running around screaming, knocking into your trolley, pushing things all over, and the mother just carries right on as if nothing's happening, and you want to you want to do something drastic to it? Um, you know what? And you go out and you go, you know, that is the most obnoxious child. You you're talking to yourself. You know what? It's not the child's fault. I guarantee if you took that child and gave it to Tasha, who loves children, it would behave within a week. 
because she teaches them to say please and thank you. She teaches them to be obedient and they come out the other end loving her, but being changed. And if Tasha or good parents can do that, give every good parent a clap. If good parents can do that, imagine what it would be like for for God if his children were allowed to wander all over the world in the most undisciplined, disorderly, bad-mannered kind of way. Because what people do is they might judge the child, but then they think a moment beyond that and they know that it's the parent's fault. So every time we behave in a way that is disgraceful, it disgraces our father. And by disgraceful, I'm not talking about a huge sin. If we go around gossiping like everybody else does in the world, that is actually a disgrace because people will say, well, Christians are exactly the same as everyone else, and we shouldn't be. Because we are representative of God on earth. So if God loves us, he will discipline us. Um, And then in Hebrews, that's the Old Testament. Now, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11 He says, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? Do you notice that encouragement I've put in capital letters? Because it's a word of encouragement that we're going to be disciplined. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. And he goes, or he or she goes on and says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. You know that hardship, before I carry on with this verse, hardship can be times when we actually go without and we're having to trust God for every single mouthful of food we put in our mouths. That's hardship. It can be hardship It's been hardship for me to have lived in pain for many, many years and to have pressed through and not let that embitter my spirit, not let it affect who I am and try very hard not to let it affect other people who think, well, if Fiona's suffering with her back, what hope is there for me? See, and and to actually look at all these things and try very, very hard to get well. Um, That is hardship. But different people go through different kinds of hardship. And what it's taught me is that exactly what the Word of God says, it says a man's spirit will sustain him in sickness, but a broken spirit who can bear. And so when you are sustained in a time of sickness or hardship, it's not, I'm sitting here going, God, but I preach healing. I believe healing. I pray for people to be healed. There are people in the church here right now that I have prayed for and they've been healed of back problems and many other things, and yet I'm not receiving a healing. Then I repent for having an evil heart of unbelief. And yet, so all these things that I grapple with, that is a great kind of hardship for me, but it has brought discipline in that I cannot preach out of my experience. The Word of God has to be the thing that that sets the boundaries. Do you understand? So it says... Um, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. Now, I'm not saying for one second that God made me sick. Remember, I said the only way we can ever tell what God is like is if we look in the Garden of Eden before there was sin. If we look at what happens in G- in Jesus, was he's the exact image of the invisible God, or if we look at what it's going to be like in heaven or in the new heavens and the new earth, and there is no sickness in any of those places. Jesus didn't make any person sick. He healed the sick whether they deserved it or not. And even when they deserved to be smitten with something, he didn't do it. So there's no way that God put sickness on us, absolutely none. So it says... Um, God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we, all, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They, being our own parents, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. 
but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. That's fantastic. You know, it's like my father had an absolute thing about punctuality, and that's why I've got it to this day. Because if we were ever not ready, he left us, we, we left, he left us at home, whether we were small or not. You just got left behind a couple of times, and you learned to be punctual. And now that was a kind of discipline imposed on us. But what, it, what that discipline did to me was it infused itself into who I am so that I am a punctual person. Because punctuality was important in the, I mean, I was disciplined if I wasn't ready. You know, and that, that kind of discipline was a jolly good smack and being left behind. And so discipline actually formulates who you are. If your parents would wrap you on the, on the elbows or something if you, if you ate with your mouth open. You know, you soon learn to close your mouth while you ate. Or whatever was important to them. Uh, you, knew, you knew what was important and what you would get disciplined for. Um, and God, when he disciplines us, disciplines us because in exactly the same way he wants to have infused into us who he is the things that are important to him. Because now I am, my father was born in 1903, so he would have been well over 100 years. He actually lived to be 75. However, um, his, who he is, has been instilled into all his children, except my oldest brother who is now dead. And he would arrive anything up to two weeks late. But all the... And all the, you know, Rav, two weeks later, oh, wasn't it supposed to come for supper? No, you were actually supposed to come for supper two weeks ago. And was supposed to be a best man at a wedding and went fishing with the, with the rings in his pockets. You know, so we'll just sideline him. He looked very like my father, so we know my father was his father. But he didn't act like, he looked like my father, but he didn't act like my father. Whereas all the rest, everybody else in the Clark family is so disciplined when it comes to time because we have actually become what my father and Tasha's grandfather and a couple of the other, you know, we've become what he was. Now, that's fantastic, but it's a, it's a tiny little thing. Now, how about... God infusing into us the things that he is, the things that he, is, that he finds important, so that every one of us begins to reflect who he is. Do you understand that? So if God says, you know what, I don't ever, ever want you to be rude to people, and that becomes the thing that the discipline of God comes down on you if you're rude to somebody, you, that's something that you, you will become a person who is not rude. You will become a person who honors and respects others. And then that in turn will be reproduced in the children you have and in people that, that are influenced by you. So that's why God disciplines us. Um, all right, sorry, let me just carry on with the scripture. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline, share in his holiness. That just does something in me. Because he says, be holy as I'm holy, and I think that's wonderful. And he will do it. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. And so we, the, the harvest that we get when God has disciplined us in whatever area it might be, the, the harvest we reap is one of righteousness, and that is something that is it's an effective change in who we are, but it's also a harvest of peace. The peace of God is upon us. So what's the, all the other things, the confusion, uh, the disorder, the, the torment, all of those things go because we've reaped a harvest of peace because we have allowed the discipline of God to be in our lives. But, you know, lots of people can't accept this. And when you talk about discipline, they think to themselves, um, I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me that because I know that God is love. So d don't, don't preach to me about discipline. And the idea is if God is love, he should never, ever do anything except indulge us. That is not love. You know, 
all right, I've only had one daughter. Doug and I had one daughter, and I think that we have done a fairly good, decent job in bringing Christy up. Who will agree with me? That was, that was a very small clap. Um, but the point is this. As an only child, she could have been completely spoiled. Because, you know, that children want things. And I've told you the story before about, uh, sorry, Christy, you have to do this. Pushing her through the, through, uh, the hypermarket in a trolley with her sitting in that, you know, the part that the kid's sitting with their legs through. And she wanted something. And I said, no, you can't have it. And she said, looked at me and she said, I want it. Now, she, was, she wasn't, she was two and a half. I want it. I said, you're not getting it. So she looked down and she looked at me and she said, I'll blow my nose at you. <laughs> and she knew that that was like the worst threat she could make to me. Because I just simply cannot stand runny noses. You know that word people use, it's spelled S-N-O-T. I will never use that word. It is repulsive. In my, it's not in my vocabulary. And so, like, don't say it, or I shall cast you out. Anyway, so, so this is the thing. And she made threats, and she did things other kids do. Uh, but anyway, I just burst out laughing. I said, oh, no, you won't. And she knew what would happen if she did. But, I mean, that was the best threat she could think up. But children will do anything to get what they want from their parents. They'll manipulate, they'll threaten, they'll sulk, they'll scream. And it's a stupid parent who gives in to those tactics and gives things to their children. Or as they get older and they want an iPad when they're five, and they come and say, but all my friends have got one. Tough. Your friends' parents are stupid. You know, there are things that are, there are times when, when gifts are appropriate and you don't just indulge a child. Just because it wants a car when it's 12 doesn't mean you give it a car. Okay. And they're going to continually push at you and push the boundaries. So now we're saying, don't speak to me about discipline because God is love. And that means God's not going to let anything ever happened to me that isn't absolutely to my liking. And every single thing I ask for, he's going to give me. Now, remember, no, maybe not, but before the few months I was off um, unwell, I preached to you on the fact, I, was, I spoke to you about the love of God, and I also spoke about prayer and how it honors God when we pray for huge things that are impossible if God didn't do them. Um, and I said to you, it honors God like Jabez when he prayed, bless me, enlarge my territory, keep me from pain so that I'll not suffer harm. And it says, and God, God answered his prayer. And God said that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And he prayed everything that people tell you not to pray, bless me enlarge my territory, give me more than I've got now. And God was honored by, God honored that prayer and answered him. Um, and whereas other people that were told, like hey, Ahaz the king, was told to pray something and ask God for a sign in the highest heavens or the deepest depths. And he said, no, I'll not test my God. And the prophet said to him, is it not enough that you test the patience of men or try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? And God wasn't impressed with him because he wouldn't pray. So now how does this match up to what I taught you then? It's perfectly in order. Because God is not going to give you something at a time that it's going to be destructive to you. And I know that in my life, I gave and gave and gave. Because I've always, I was generous. Even when I was demon possessed, I was generous. Um, but gen so generosity has never been an issue to me. And tithing and offering has never been an, an, uh, any kind of problem. It's, I've just always believed in it and done it. But I never saw a harvest come to me. I would give and give and give, and I did. I increased as I went along slowly, but I never saw a massive increase. Even though in the early days of giving, I was probably giving 90% if you, if you judged what I got in. I was giving most of it away. However, there have been times in my life where I have had a massive harvest from God, and just at the time when I most needed it. So I'm much happier knowing that God loves me enough 
to keep back and store it up for me. It's like a parent who starts a bank account for their child when they're born. And they begin to put some money in or they buy them unit trusts and you just put a hundred rand a month in there and you save, 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 save. And then when they, it's time for them to matriculate and maybe go into tertiary education, you're able to say, look what I've got for you. I saved this money for you and you give it to them and they're able to pay for all their, all their um, university fees. That is what wise parents do. They will, they will store up for their children. Um, and God does that with us because if God had given me, if I gave $7 today and I got $70 at the end of that week, it wouldn't really have had any impact. I'd have just eaten more McDonald's and got fatter and fatter because that was what I spent my money on, McDonald's. Um, so what happened was that I got just enough to go by, to go to a grocery shop and buy food, but not enough to just indulge myself. And also with all of that being stored up, it was incredible. I could see the miracle working power of God when I got the house I live in now, which is on half an acre of land. It had all kinds of, it had, a nursery had been run from there. It was a house that had... Right now, it's got a three-bedroomed house, which is what I live in. Um, Christy and Sid live in the new section of the house, which is a duplex, which is sort of separated from mine by a staircase. Ida, who's worked for me forever, has a flat downstairs, which is where the man lived when he was building the house. And Sid has a studio, a drumming studio, right underneath my house. So I get to hear the drumming all day. And um, people come in and they go, what's that? I go, it's just the it's Sid drumming. Doesn't it bother you? I go, not at all. It doesn't. I mean, drum, drum, drum. Beat, beat, beat. I like it. Bam, bam, bam. Um, and so it, it doesn't drive me mad in the least. But I mean, that is what, do you know how much we paid, how much I paid for that? 190,000 rand. And then took an extra bond of 100,000 rand just in order to finish it because it was incomplete. And then over and above that was blessed with furniture to fill that house. Now, I call that a harvest. I don't know about you. And so I'm living in the harvest of God at this time. And people could look at it and go, how could you possibly afford it? Well, the answer is I couldn't. And, but God is the one who knows, and he is the one who stores it up for us. And so he is a good father. And good fathers don't just save up for their children. Good fathers will also discipline them. And that's really what I'm looking at. Um, and when we say God is love, God loves me. We've got to remember what I taught you last week, and that is that love is not feelings-based. It's not feeling romantic. It's not being sentimental. Love is something that is a thing, an attitude of heart that grows within us, and it affects the way in which we treat people. And so this is what I read it to you in three different versions last time. Um, in the voice, Phillips, J.B. Phillips, and in the new... Uh, covenant version, but now today I'm reading it to you in the NIV. And it says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it's not proud. It does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Um, and so if we just look at those attributes, we can, I'm just going to list them for you here. This is what love is. It's patient, kind. It doesn't envy what you've got, and it doesn't boast about what it's got. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It protects and always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now, that's a scripture we know. But this is the thing I honestly pray that you get hold of today. 
I can read that scripture to you, and I'm going to read it to you again, but instead of love, I'm going to put in the word Jesus. I could put in God the Father, I could put in the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to read that again with Jesus. Just listen. Um, this is, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, this is where I want to pick it up. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but Jesus rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects. Jesus always trusts. Jesus always hopes. Jesus always perseveres. Jesus never fails. That is it in a nutshell. But now, what God is working towards with us, and this is why discipline is essential, what he's wanting to work in us is so that I could read that same scripture and insert my name or your name. And it would be exactly the same. People would be able to go, yes, that's true. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to choose the end. Okay. All right. So... Ian is patient. Ian is kind. These are true things. Ian does not envy. Ian does not boast. Ian is not proud. Ian does not dishonor others. Ian is not self-seeking. Ian is not easily angered. Ian keeps no record of wrongs. Ian does not delight in evil, but Ian rejoices with the truth. Um, Ian always protects, Ian always trusts, Ian always hopes, Ian always perseveres, Ian never fails. Now, I've chosen somebody, I just chose them at random out of our team. But when I read that now and read it aloud, I realize how true it is. And see, that is, I mean, I've loved Ian from the time I've known him, which is since 1981 or something, hey? Somewhere around there. Um, but the point is, I don't think, although he had good attributes, I don't think that could always be said about you, could it, Ian? No. And so this is something that's been worked within him. And if you look at that, patience is one of the attributes of, of love. And to be patient, it means that you don't get things when you want to get them. You have to wait for them. And that develops the patience in you. You can be somebody who's been really, really unkind. We have a neighbor who just goes hysterical when dogs bark. Um, he, uh, but we've I've adjusted, and I bring my dogs in, and I don't let them run outside. But he came over to us the other day to chat about a dog somewhere in our neighborhood that barks at Nat. And he wants to sue the owner once he finds out who the owner is. So Sid said to him, well, it's not our dogs. They sleep inside at Nat. So he said, oh. But I knew, but he, he came to chat not to complain. But now that guy is working himself up into an absolute rage. He, like he's churning inside. I was thinking about him this morning for some reason. And I thought, I wonder if I should go and suggest to Robin that he uses earplugs. And then I thought, maybe, maybe he, you know, I'll just grab some from the church, but maybe he, he won't take kindly to that idea. But I was trying to be helpful. But you see, the thing is, when something like that happens, you can either just let rage boil out or you can let these other attributes come in. And even there, we're thinking about earplugs. Honestly and truly, I was not trying to be comical. I was trying to be kind. And my brain has been occupied with thinking, how can I make Robin's life easier? I already don't let my dogs out the front yard. I keep them confined. Uh, but now they're other dogs. Okay, I can't go around and force everybody to do what I'm doing. So the answer is I will go and give Robin some earplugs. So it was kindly motivated, but then at least I had the wisdom to know that he wouldn't see that. And so Jesus wants all of us with all of these attributes, keep no record of wrongs. Guys, if you keep any kind of record of what somebody else has done to you so that it churns inside you and you can actually bring it up at a, a moment's notice. That is keeping a record of wrongs. And you need to let that thing go because that is unholy. It is ungodly. It is unloving. 
You know, there's a place where Paul says to them, and he's talking about eating meat that's sold in the market and so on, and he said, you know what? And also about Christians who took one another to court. And he said, listen, why did you rather let yourself be wronged? Just like if, if, the, if he's that serious that he wants to take you to court, just let, let it go. And he said, if I, he said, I'd rather never eat meat again in my life than eat it out of a lack of love for my brother who's going to be upset by what I'm eating. And the, the, if we read the Bible with these things in mind, we will see that holding on to our own rights is not a loving thing to do. We might have a right to things, but we've also got to continually think about what it does to another person. And I remember when, the, uh, when I had a neighbor, not Robin, he's been there forever, but a neighbor down below us, um, God, rest, uh, God bless her, I nearly said rest her soul. But anyway, she, uh, now I've got this thing about trees. I am tree mad. I'm your original tree hugger. And I've got a beautiful tree just as you drive in through my gates on the left. And so this particular neighbor came and said to me, um, this is sticking out over our driveway. Now, a branch of it. Now, a long driveway. The house is 100 meters away. But the, the branch was hanging out over her driveway. Could, do I, did I mind if it, was cut, if it was cut down where it hit her driveway? So I said, no, certainly. So she said, okay, the tree feller is going to come on Monday. That's not a tree fellow, it's a tree feller. He fells trees. So um, she said he's going to come and cut the tree down on Mon the branch down on Monday, uh, but he's going to come early. So I said, that's fine. I'll sleep late on Monday. It's my day off. And so, but somebody will be here to let him in. Now the arrangement was, it was going to, this branch was going to be cut off here, where it, impinged on the driveway. Now, it's a big tree with great big branches. When I woke up and I went outside and I looked at it, I screamed. What's happened to my tree? Because she'd cut, he'd come in and she told this guy to cut it off almost flush with the trunk. And you know that I actually stood there and wept. And when I take the dogs for a walk, I would come back and I'd see my branch and I'd start to cry because not it, it affected the way the tree looked, but it also meant that my kitchen window and into the house could be seen clearly from the, from the road, which it wasn't able to when the branch was there. And um, I really, really struggled with it. And I said, God, I absolutely forgive her. But every time I saw the branch, I'd want to kill her. And um, so the one, uh, this went on for about two weeks and God was like moving further and further away from me, I think. And so one day as I walked back home, I looked at it and I started this thing in my brain, my tree. And the Spirit of God spoke to me clearly and said, that is a tree and she has a soul. And it really just convicted me and I let that thing go. And, be, and every time I was tempted to, just to wail over my tree, I would pray for her soul. You know what happens? It wasn't long and she moved away, which was also a blessing for me. But whenever I think of her, well, she would also call my gardener down to the side of the road and tell him what to do in my yard. And um, I would be told, go down and tell her what's what. And I keep thinking, she's got a soul. She's got a soul. She's got a soul. <laughs> And I'm a Christian and she knows it. So, um, so she's moved away. So hopefully she's not harassing somebody else. But anyway, so when I think of it now, I pray for her. But see, we've got to be so changed. Now, if I had already been changed, that wouldn't have been an issue. I would have, got, I would have gone like Jesus. Well, you know what? It's a tree. I cursed a fig tree once. So if she felt like cutting down that branch, just let it go and move along. But I couldn't. I had to... Overcome the desire to murder, to take the way of Cain and murder my brother. But you know, that's, Jesus wants the Holy Spirit's work in us to be so complete that the, the word becomes flesh within us. And I'm just having a look at what I've got left to do. I'm going to stop here because I don't want to restrict Christy. Um, I haven't finished. I thought I had a really, really short sermon, but I talk a lot.
Does anybody else feel like uber convicted? <laughs> It's like reading the list of things that Ian is, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Ian's all those things, but I'm not. So it's a, it's a good thing when you get taught about discipline and realize that you need some. Jesus helped me. She already prayed, so I'm asking for that anointing to be upon me. But um, I'm going to be speaking to you really quickly along the line of discipline, and this is a specific area of discipline that I believe God is wanting to bring into the church in general. So I'm going to be speaking to you very quickly about Miriam. Now, Miriam was the oldest sister of Moses. She was born to Amram and Jochebed, and she is used very early on in childhood to protect the chosen deliverer, and she shows extreme wisdom in a complicated situation. I'm going to be reading portions of scripture to you and then just giving you three points. My mother's telling me to slow down. I'm still afraid of her. Um, The two-year-old in me that knew, I can also honestly tell you about this woman my whole life, she never once made an empty threat. So by the time I was three... By the time I was three, I could push my dad because, you know, I could just push him a bit because, you know, he's my dad and I'm a little girl. My mother, nothing. She'd glare at me and she still glares at me and I'm still afraid. So I learned by the time I was three, if she said she would do something, if I didn't listen, she would actually do it. So I gave up. If you do that, I'm going to do this. I was like, ah, this lady, she's for real. I'm going to get beaten if I say. So I just did it. It it worked really well. And the good thing about teaching your children to respond to you is that then they respond to God. And when God says do this, they don't push because they're terrified of what could happen. So thank you for that. Um, So let's read in Exodus 2 verses 1 to 10. And it says, about this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister, Miriam, approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. And later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. And the princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. So here we see how Miriam demonstrated great resolve and courage, even at a young age. She boldly approached the princess of Egypt, who had the power of life and death over her, and made a suggestion that ended up preserving the life of Moses. And so God used Miriam to deliver the deliverer. I'm trying to just establish a base for you here to see how Miriam from a very young age was clearly equipped with wisdom, was clearly equipped with a boldness and an ability to make decisions that ended up preserving people. In this instance, her brother who would become the chosen, he was the chosen deliverer of of the Israelite people. And as we proceed through scripture, we see how Miriam is at the right hand of Moses through his journey as deliverer of Israel. In Exodus 15, verse 20 to 21, it says, Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine and led all the women as they played their tambourines and danced. And Miriam sang the song, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. And so here, Miriam is actually called the prophet herself, which means she hears from God and gives his message to the people. Miriam was called by God. Miriam was anointed by God. Miriam was used by God powerfully. You, 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 you with me on this one? She was called, anointed, called a prophet herself, sang a song of prophecy that people, the, the nation of Israel to this day still praise and still sing. But something happened in her life that should cause all of us to be very sober-minded. Um, and we're going to be able to look at the correlation between Miriam's life and our own. So this is in Numbers 12, verses 1 to 16. While they were at Hazelot, Miriam and Aaron chastised Moses for marrying a foreign woman, a Cushite, and it was true that he did indeed marry such an African. Miriam and Aaron said this, has the eternal one spoken only through Moses? No, the eternal one has also spoken through us. Now the eternal one heard this. For his part, Moses was a uniquely humble fellow, more humble than anyone in the entire world. All of a sudden, the eternal called the three siblings together. The eternal one said, come here, you three, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Join me at the congregation tent. They did. 
The eternal one descended in a cloud column, stood at the tent opening and summoned just Aaron and Miriam. They came forward. The eternal one said, listen to me. When there are prophets in your midst, I, the eternal one, will show myself to them in visions and will sound my voice in their dreams. But it's different with my servant Moses. I have entrusted him above anyone else in my whole house and with him I communicate face to face. We speak directly and without riddles. He can even see the very form of the eternal. So why aren't you nervous about criticizing my servant Moses? The eternal left quite angry with Miriam and Aaron. And when the cloud lifted from the congregation tent, you could see that Miriam had been stricken with a disfiguring skin condition. Her skin looked white like snow. Aaron looked at her, saw this, and immediately turned to Moses. Aaron said, please, Moses, my Lord, don't punish us for this offense that we so stupidly committed. Don't leave her in this partial death like a stillborn baby whose flesh is already half rotted away. Moses pleaded to the, eternal, to the Lord and said, oh God, I ask you to please heal her. The eternal one said to Moses, if her father had been angry with her and made it obvious by, say, spitting in her face, wouldn't she have to bear her shame for a week? Just so you must ostracize her from the camp for seven days, and after that she can re rejoin the community. So Miriam was shut out of the community for seven days, which also meant that the whole group didn't travel until Miriam was brought back in, and they set out again, and then they journeyed and set up camp. So the lessons to be learned here is, number one, that God does not approve of a critical spirit. We spoke about how Miriam was called, anointed, chosen, appointed, a prophet, heard the voice of God, communicated the voice of God from God to the people, sang a song that still thousands of years later is sung when the Israelites remember what God did for them. But, Moses, but Miriam stepped into a very dangerous place and that was the place of criticism. Just because Miriam herself was a spokeswoman for God didn't give her the right to criticize God's chosen deliverer, Moses. We have to be very, very careful that our private concerns don't become public criticisms. Very careful. God was actually incredibly unconcerned with what Moses had done. Very unconcerned. His focus was on Miriam and Aaron and what they had done. And, you know, they were freaking out because he married a Cushite who's an Ethiopian woman. And we don't know any details surrounding it. All we know is that God didn't focus on what Moses had done. He focused on the criticism that came out of the people that were supposed to be standing with him in leadership. And instead of supporting him or instead of even covering him, maybe what they did is they began to criticize him and they did so publicly. And so God came through. And I think it's quite funny how the voice says it. God was quite angry. I'm like, wow, that's an understatement. But our private concerns cannot become public criticism. No person is perfect. The, the person that I know in my life who's the closest thing to perfect is a friend of mine called Phyllis. Crystal and I had the tragic privilege of growing up with Phyllis, and Phyllis never did anything wrong. Phyllis was patient, kind. It was like she was actually Jesus, but in a blonde girl form. And she never did anything wrong at school. The only time she got into trouble at school was when Crystal and I spoke to her. And then she'd get demerits and sometimes got into trouble, but it was our fault. We were the ones talking and Phyllis was sitting there trying to turn around and then we'd all get in trouble, but it was us, it wasn't her. So, but even Phyllis isn't completely perfect, okay? And if we look carefully, we could find fault with anyone. Our job, our job, and I can say this to you because I'm not a pastor. So our job as the sheep is to obey God and honor his chosen leaders, there's a principle that John Bevere teaches called the 101% principle, which means even if there's somebody around you that you wanna just punch in the face, you find one, the 1% of good in that person and give it 100% of your attention. So even if it's like, wow, she's got nice ears, focus on that, <laughs> encourage her, like your ears are amazing, hey, congratulations. Like do what you have to do, find a way to be able to encourage that person, even if they're the person that's just like a nice pile drive, you know, like that's what you wanna do to them, you have the 1% of good, because I promise you there's 1% of good in everybody, everybody. You find that and you give it 100% of your attention. That's our job. And when I was very young and much wilder um, than I am now, Jane, I, I had it out, Jane disciplined me greatly in my life, for which I'm very grateful. And um, I came in ranting about something as usual, and she just said to me, listen, your job is to obey. If you're right and the leader's wrong, God will sort the leader out, but he will judge you for your heart. And I took that and man, I've tried hard to run with that because the point is every single one of God's leaders are gonna make mistakes. You need to make peace with that. We're all just people, nobody's a robot here. 
every pastor is just a human and they are going to make mistakes, which is also why your salvation can't be dependent on their behavior. It's gotta be dependent on Jesus because if a leader does, if a leader does fall off the bandwagon, it doesn't give you a right to now turn your back on God because your salvation's rooted in Jesus, not in a pastor. There has to be something in the church of God that doesn't look at leaders and then use that as a reason to give themselves an excuse to sin and step into a place of sin. No, your salvation is based and rooted in Jesus, not in Fiona, not in Jane, not in any of the ministry team. Firstly, that's too much pressure for them, but we walk out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We stand before God alone and can't say, my leader did this. God's gonna say, your leader's not here, you here. What's happening with you? What's happening with your heart? And so the nature of humanity is to make mistakes. However, just because we discern something doesn't give us the right to talk about it. That was like major revelation for me. You know, because some people, some people are like naturally not suspicious. Like my cousin Tasha, she believes the best of everybody. Tasha and I love each other very much, but we have had full on screaming matches, normally about American politics, strangely enough. And other times about people, because I'm like, Tasha, how can you still believe the best of this person? She's like, you know, you've got to give them a chance. I'm like, no, you don't. But I'm grateful, you, you, you know, iron sharpens iron and we had, we had it out, man. We love each other very much, but when other people get involved, eh, sometimes. But it's a beautiful attribute, actually. Optimistic people are actually very needed in the church of God. And I'm suspicious by nature. I got that Lebanese blood running through my veins and I look, I'm like, hey, where are you going? What are you doing, you know? Suspicious. I am. My mother is a complete optimist and sometimes, you it makes me angry because I'm like, you need to be real. But the thing is, God, God sees what's going on. And it's not my job to fix anything, actually. My response is my responsibility. My outlook is my responsibility. What God wants to do with me is my responsibility. And so you can either fault find, and you'll find something wrong with everybody, even Phyllis, if you look hard enough. I haven't found anything yet, but I'm, you know, I'm still working on it 30 years later. But you will find something wrong with everybody. Phyllis, yeah, I can't even, I actually don't even have anything. But just because you discern something doesn't give you the right to talk about it, okay? So number one, God does not approve of a critical spirit. Number two, criticism always leads to leprosy, always. Leprosy, always, also known as Hansen's disease, is a chronic infection. And initially infections are without symptoms and typically remain this way for five to as long as 20 years. Symptoms that develop in, include issues with the nerves, respiratory tract, skin and eyes, and this may result in a lack of ability to feel pain, and thus the loss of parts of extremities due to repeated injury. And weakness and poor eyesight may also be present. I've got two images to show you of what leprosy looks like. These are the tamest images I could find. Everything else was like oozing and flowing and made me feel a bit sick. But this is the one. You can see how this man's hands, have, his fingers have eventually come away and he can't feel anymore. The next one, if you've got it, Jane, thanks somebody else's fingers because it, de- it, 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 it causes your ability to feel to be removed. And so I want you to look at that image and think about this, that when we are in a place of criticism, spiritually we look like this. Spiritual leprosy is incredibly dangerous because it numbs our ability to see and feel God. So this person might have an inability to see and feel what's going on around them, but spiritual leprosy is so much more dangerous because it numbs our ability to feel what's going on in the spirit and to see and hear God. And in order to survive in these times, I do believe we're in the end times. I'm not gonna give you a breakdown of my eschatology, but I do believe that we're in the end times. And if, we, if there's ever been a generation that needs to be able to trust in their ability to hear God, it's now. But criticism is swept through the church and as a result, instead of producing an army for God, we've produced a bunch of lepers who are deadened and unable to to function as they're supposed to. And the reason, the disease of the soul that comes in is criticism. When we are critical, we open ourselves up to becoming spiritual lepers. And this will also mean that we end up being cut off from the community of God. The whole community had to stop because Miriam was in a condition of leprosy. And when we step into criticism and we're spiritual lepers, we hinder the body of Christ globally from being able to move forward into what God wants for us. I don't wanna be found on the other end of that in heaven when God says, well, this is where I wanted the church in South Africa to go, but then you came in with your mouth. 
and you came in with your opinions and you came in and end up, ended up derailing a bunch of Christians because of your bitterness and your criticism of church leaders instead of covering them or saying, hey, they're going to make a mistake, but you need to focus on yourself and you need to focus on your own salvation. And as a result, instead of pushing our young people and pushing the army forward, we end up holding them back because God can't move forward. The community can't move forward when those that should be leaders are lepers. And I'm not talking about being a paid pastor. You are a leader. Whether you like it or not, when you become saved and step in, you become an ambassador and people are watching you. And your life might be the only Jesus anybody ever sees. And so you've got to ask yourself, what kind of an ambassador are you? How are you repping? So number one, God does not approve of a critical spirit. Number two, criticism always leads to leprosy. But number three, and this is the fun, well, the happy point, God can forgive and restore anyone. In those days, leprosy was incurable, but God did heal Miriam. And no matter what levels of criticism we've displayed, we can find mercy. But in order to find that mercy, we have to acknowledge it, see ourselves in it. And again, the problem is that so often criticism's bedfellow is pride. And pride is the one thing that hinders you from being able to see in the mirror. Pride causes you to look in the mirror and see somebody else and see what's wrong with another person. But if you listen to the sermon this morning, you shouldn't have been thinking in your head, yo, yo, that list, eh? So there's that, the guy next to me needs to listen to this list. He needs to step up. You should have been assessing yourself. Like I wasn't thinking, oh, Uncle I'm so glad you didn't pick me because Christy is patient. Uh, not so much. Just being transparent, you know? Around me for long enough, you're going to figure out patience is not my gifting. And God is still desperately trying to work that into me 29 years later. Not, not a great uh, example of that, but I'm still working on it. But we have to be prepared to acknowledge it and repent. Nobody's safe from falling. We have to be aware of that. The minute you think, oh, I'll never fall, where sirens are going off. All of us can be called by God, anointed by God, chosen by God, appointed by God, all of those things. But we have to guard ourselves from criticism. It's like a death sentence. And if, you've been, if you realize that you've been guilty of having a critical spirit, especially towards leaders, you can be free by acknowledging it and repenting. But this is the other thing that I'd like to just say in the last minute, winding down. Repentance does not mean you say sorry and then carry on with the same behavior. Repentance means you say sorry, you turn around and you walk in a completely opposite direction. And when you are truly repentant, it will be so obvious to everybody because there will be change in you can't change yourself, but as you acknowledge and repent, God begins to change you, cleanses you of all that stuff, and it's obvious to everybody that there has actually been a heart change. And so, if you know that you need to repent, I'm asking you to close your eyes. I'm actually, actually, before you close your eyes, I want you to see, I'm turning around like this, because I don't want to see you. I love you and everything, but I don't want to see this part. I'm turning around like this, and I'm looking forward, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to all be looking at God, not at each other. I want you, everybody to close your eyes. My eyes are closed too. And I'm asking you, and this is for you, not for God. If you know that you've been guilty of harboring a critical spirit and you want to get free, before God, nobody's looking around. I'm not looking around. Nobody is. I want you to just put your hand up as an acknowledgement to God that God, I've been guilty of, crit of being critical and I want to change. I'm not going to ask you to keep it up. I just want you to lift it high an acknowledgement to God that this is what you know that you need to be changed of, okay? You can put it down now. I'm gonna turn around. But I'm asking as I pray that you would join with me in your heart and, and say, God, I want to change. I want this thing in me to be removed. And so, Father, I pray that as the power of your word is here, God, it's no person that can bring change to us. It's only your word as it, as it enters us and it brings light and it brings life. As your word comes in like a hammer smashing, but it also is a balm that heals us. As your word comes in like a sword dividing between soul and spirit, between the heart, between our intents and our motives. God, I'm asking you that every person who acknowledged that they know they've been guilty of criticism, I'm asking that you would do a miracle in every heart and life and that you would bring freedom in 
Jesus' name. We acknowledge it. We repent of it. We say, Jesus, please see our hearts. Please cleanse us. We do not want to be found in the camp of the lepers because of criticism. We want to be walking with the community of God going forward to where you want to take us. I pray, Jesus, that you would do a miracle of being able to honor and being able to cover and being able to love in spite of what we see. And I pray that there would just be such a revelation that would come to all of us about our perspective and our outlook. And that before we open our mouths, we would think. And before we just speak what we feel, we would actually stop and maybe actually pray for our leaders instead of just speaking harshly against them. And I'm trusting that you're gonna do a miracle in this community of people, that when you look from heaven, you would see a people that are clean and leper free. That when you look down from heaven, you would see a bunch of people that are engaged fully in seeing the best in others and seeing the best in their leaders. And I'm trusting that you are gonna do a miracle and cleanse us in Jesus' name, amen.